All right. Good morning, everybody. It is day nine, March 31st, last day awesome. of March. March is so long in New England. Green has sprung here. No, not um, here. We thought today uh, we would kick around some thinking about the teaching of writing. Um, and I'm interested, Penny, in this tweet that was uh, tagged, both of us were tagged on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll just read the tweet. Uh, yeah. Somebody had written, somebody had written, my daughter had a paper refused because it was more than five pages. My other one, 11th grader, says she's not allowed to use I or you in her argument essay. It's followed by this question, what other rules inhibit expression and student agency and lack of real world transfer and exemplars? And I don't know, it's, it's set off a, a thread that I find fascinating. I mean, I replied, you know, my least favorite rule is you can't start a sentence with a conjunction Mm. Uh, you replied, uh, well, wh what did you say about argument at the university? Well, just that we absolutely let students use I let's. We encourage um, the weaving of per personal experience with the evidence that you've collected and how the evidence you collect can collide with your experience in a way that brings new thinking to you, or it can, you know, just kind of support and encourage your thinking. But the, the idea being, we don't lose ourselves at the schoolhouse door. We bring ourselves in. It reminds me a bit of Rosenblatt, right? You bring your whole self to your reading, which means that my relationship with the book is different than yours. And what I remember from that book and the way I read it is dependent on who I am. That same thinking is part of Elbow and Newkirk and so many people that I've admired as someone who learned about writing. Um, Donald Murray, um, Crafting a Life in Essay, Story and Poem, I think is the subtitle, um, wrote extensively about the need to craft personal experiences in because you're closest to your subject, which is where your writing would become not at the forefront of your thinking. Do you know what I mean? Like if I'm trying to write in a particular form, I'm thinking so much about the form that I'm losing sight a little bit of the through line of my idea. And he kept saying that you follow this thing that's happened to you that you want to express and you stay true to your meaning because you're not thinking so much about form. And I just think there's a there's something lost when all we care about is rules. Well, in the last, I mean, what, let's talk about the impermanence of language and rules in a moment. But when I'm, when I'm thinking specifically about argument paper, you know, I always thought my favorite student argument papers was when we took the traditional argument paper and we had it supported by a personal uh, anecdote, yeah. right? And so like this happened to my uncle and this right. is why you should support this law. And it's right. the weaving of the personal with the argument itself, you know, I mean, it, we've said this in workshops, you, you watch any State of the Union address, I don't care who the president is, you know, a Republican or Democrat, they're, they're going to try to talk you into something. And they're going to have somebody sitting up in the balcony, and they're going to point to that person and tell that person's story, right, as part of the argument. And I think this, this is a bigger issue, this artificial s separation of discourse, but more at a micro level, you know, this idea that you can't start a sentence with and or but, or you can't finish a sentence, uh, you know, with this or that. I, it, it just, you know, if you look at any authentic piece of writing, if, and I think somebody in the thread said, look at Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail, which is an incredible argument piece. And, and look at all the rules that he breaks in that piece. It seems... It seems weird that, that we're, we're still stuck to all these archaic rules to me. Well, and I, I'm so struck by the idea that, you know, I often speak of my experience at the university I'm at, which does not represent all universities at all. But when our department talks about writing, we say we want students who can determine the audience and the rules of that genre for that audience by looking at mentor texts that reflect 
who they're writing for and the rules that apply. And so I'm not saying that a student won't ever run into, you need this exact form, but rather they've learned how to determine their voice and their style and their engagement with writing and built confidence so that when they hit that, they follow the rules. You know, if somebody on my campus is demanding six sentences per paragraph, I wouldn't be shocked. There are people who grew up that way and believe that's a particular valued form, but I also would want my students to be able to believe they can write poetry and story and commentary. I mean, right. argument exists in the world as editorial and commentary. You, you bring two examples to mind. Uh, when my daughter was in high school, she had written an introduction to a, an essay for her English class. And she came to me mm -hmm. and she said, dad, I need some help with this. And I was really surprised because she doesn't, she didn't yeah. come to me ever for help. And I, I know I've told you this story before. And I said, what's the problem? And she said, it, it, it's, it feels choppy to me. And I read it and it was really choppy. And I said, well, why don't you do some combining here? And she said, I can't. The teacher said it has to be exactly eight sentences. This was in an AP class. It had to be exactly eight sentences. It had to have three of these sentences and four of those sentences. Um, and then the second thing that comes to mind when you say that is that, you know, Jim Burke, who we talked to yesterday, yeah. actually joined, joined that thread. And he said that he was with a bunch of middle schoolers and he asked them, how many sentences should a paragraph have? And they all had a definitive answer, six, seven, eight, which is crazy. I mean, I, where are they getting this idea that, that that's, where a parag that's what a paragraph has to look like? Mm. And so when you said AP, that was an AP class, my brain went to, oh, the AP test. And, and you and I wrote a chapter for an upcoming textbook for new teachers and the interesting thing, I remember telling you that I'd spent seven hours researching this collision that occurred in 1983 when a nation at risk came out under Reagan. And my one of the people in our wedding was working for Reagan at the time and sent it to me. And I remember I was in Klatskanai, Oregon. I get this federal document in my mailbox. And it says, you know, if a foreign power had brought this kind of medio mediocrity of um, schools, into our country, we would have considered it an act of war. I mean, very inflammatory. Basically said, our standards aren't high enough and we need testing. By no child left behind, there was no turning back. Yearly tests, you know, first just reading and math. But when that happened, Don Murray said to me, there's two things you should know about the fact they're not, they're not testing writing. It's good because people <laughs> won't get trapped right. and it's bad because they won't teach it. And right. so what we have now is this whole generation that has been raised to believe that you need to write for a test. And I mean, generation of teachers, because if I'm being evaluated based on what my kids did on that test, I'm gonna start narrowing my teach, teaching to test taking strategies. And I'm sorry, but a formula for an essay can work on a test, right? And a formula for a paragraph can work on a test. If you've ever read about who grades those tests, they hire people at minimum wage to go through a paper a minute and give them a holistic score. You know, nobody ever asked, what is the best way to evaluate a student's progress in the process of writing and coming to understand revision and coming to know how to narrow a subject, how to collect evidence? They simply gave us a formula. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, Kelly, you can like tell me to shut up. But the frustrating thing is that these things have perseverated in the culture as if that's good writing when none of us would read five paragraph essays in the local newspaper. And it's not just on the essay level too. I mean, it's, it's these tiny, tiny rules like you can never have a fragment or, uh, you know, a run on sentence is always a sin. Yeah. Um, you know, and then you look at authentic writing in the real world. Both of those are used for effect. For oh, my effect. God. Kelly, at that conference that we did at Kylene's house, remember Tyrolia? And one of my mentor texts was the Leonard Pitts um, one where he has the run on sentence. And this teacher came up and said, are you trying to tell me a run on sentence is a craft move? And I said, yes. But you could tell it was just like, you got to be kidding me. That's just wrong. And I was like, oh, but 
watch what he's doing with it. He's trying to make you tired. I don't know. We just lost something in, in our understanding. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, two things. Number one is, first of all, whose rules are these? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, as I told you before we came on, my daughter was a linguistics major at UCLA and she, she talks a lot about the impermanence of language and how a language is a living, breathing thing. And you're right. It comes down to audience and purpose, right? Mm -hmm. How you write to this person is very different than how you might write in a job interview or something like that. Yeah. And it's recognizing that audience and purpose, you know, the impermanence of the language that, that, that it's some rule that somebody decided was good writing 40 years ago just seems really, really odd to me. Well, and think about what you just said about if it's audience and purpose, but our students only ever practice the audience that is distant from them, who cares nothing about them, this test-taking audience, and their purpose is only to get it right, not to make you and me think more clearly about X. Wow, what, no wonder kids don't like right. writing. And as we've often said, you know, telling them a, a template, giving them a template or a formula or, or, or how many paragraphs is really the first step in stripping the writer from as many decision, you know, from an incredible yeah. decision-making, you know, big decisions that writers have to make, which is very ironic because as you mentioned, we have just finished writing a chapter uh, for a book that's uh, coming out uh, and on, on best practices in teaching. And our chapter specifically is on the best uh, practices in teaching of writing. And yeah. the irony is, is that every chapter in this book follows a very specific template. And so for you and I to sit down and try to plug into that template was yep. incredibly painful. Well, and do you remember we both went, well, does anybody see the irony of this? And then we sent the question back. Do we have to follow the template? And no one would answer. <laughs> and I kept thinking, you know, it's just, I understand um, you and I have both been through a publishing cycle where they've asked for you to follow a template. But I do think that we dumb down the teaching when it's all just rules. We dumb down the, the actual difficulty of writing. Right. And so as we have both written about and didn't originate with us, right. but as we've written about over the years, the, the way to teach authentic writing is to study authentic writing. It's to yeah. look at what this writer over here did and ask the question, you know, what did the writer do here? What did the writer do there? Uh, and it's, it's much, you know, we've heard this argument, right? That that my kids are not very good writers. And so I have to teach them formula first and then I can wean them off of that. And we just disagree with that completely. We've taken the most remedial writers and really had them grow just by planning them next to the right kinds of models. Right? right. And do you remember Tom Newkirk said to us editing this last book that writers need to understand their options, right? Their options are not rule bound. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, the resource that you started and we continue might be something we might share. Yeah, we um, shared this in our um, work with uh, Heinemann for the webinar we were doing. Wait, wait, sorry. I was trying to share my screen. It started to end, <laughs> <laughs> but it won't let me. There we go. Um, so we started this for the workshop this fall, and you can see that we've now had 60 people add to this Padlet, which I will absolutely link on um, this the 30 Conversations page. But you can see if you scroll over that we have simply created categories, and there are more categories than are here. Like we have essays about food. I wanted to do sports essays. I don't know if you saw Rick Riley's one where he said, I miss sports so, so, so much in uh, 2020. I just love that piece, just that the way we were grieving for things that weren't the same. But down each of these columns then is a whole lot of examples, both digital and straight text that, you know, these are all personal essays. I mean, I could learn so much just staying in one column. Yep. Yeah, it's so rich. And I think um, 
one of the things we want to emphasize is this is a work in progress that this is not closed off to those of you who are listening right now, that if you had uh, examples that you thought were exemplary, that would be very helpful for kids to figure out how to write in certain areas, that you are invited to join us in creating this sort of crowdsourced um, resource. Absolutely. And one of the pieces, um, one of the categories is collections of essays, because if we want to become more knowledgeable about this form, then I think we should read deeply within that form. And so we've collected several that we think are worth studying. Um, and, you know, I have, um, since we started this, turned off comments um, on each of these individual categories simply because um, there was, unfortunately, some inappropriate stuff being posted, and I don't know why. But, yeah. um, I think that there is a professional learning community in your school, I hope, but in this greater world of NCTE, where we can have conversations like this, where we can challenge things that maybe are handed to us by curriculum directors or others. And I needed to work my thinking out with people who wanted to do that thinking before I could go and challenge what was happening in my department, because I was in a building where the five paragraph essay ruled um, it didn't just rule English class. It was all they wrote in social studies. It was, I went into a classroom and it was on the board as the most important lesson on writing, the five paragraph essay. And I was like, wow, just, mm. you know, mm. that comes from a culture that created it to, to have a, a payoff, which was test scores. It's a big can of worms, too, because the term standard English is very problematic. It right? is. It's been challenged at the very four C's level. Yeah. It's um, whose like voice who's and whose language. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, um, again, audience and purpose. For sure. I was thinking about, remember this fall, I uh, went to help out some kids with a digital composition, and one of them said, uh, yeah, will you bring your um, uh, headphones over here and listen? And I went to get him and the girl goes, oh yeah, you got all the drip kill. And I was like, what? She goes, your AirPod Pros. And I'm like, is drip like, <laughs> like money, like stuff? I don't know what that means, but I just love that language evolves. Kids are using language. I want them to use it in their essays because it's them. Right, exactly. Hmm. So um, yeah, I mean, and, and voice is such an important part of it. I mean, if you, yeah. if you, pigeonhole kids into formula. And one of the things that you strip almost immediately is voice. And so, I don't know, I just thought it was an interesting thing that we could kind of kick around this idea of, uh, I think how sometimes following uh, traditional strict rules gets in the way of really authentic, really heartfelt kinds of, of pieces that our kids have written. Yeah, I think it, um... I don't know. It strips the th very things that we value. Yeah. yeah. So. All right. Well, that was that was fun. I'd be interested to hear what other people think. So, if you want to join the conversation, you could certainly, uh, uh, you know, add comments below. But um, absolutely. Uh, I, I think I think it was a good good chat. So. All right. With that, uh, it may be that uh, it may be. Uh, are we on again on Friday? Yeah, April we... Fool's Day. I'm okay. going to have to think of a way to fool you. <laughs> <laughs> April Fool's jokes of the past. All right, All everybody. Right. Thank you so Bye, much. Bye, everybody. We'll see, we'll see you again tomorrow. Absolutely.